Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining me on the Slice of Healthcare podcast. I'm your host, Jared Taylor. Joining me today is the co-founder and CEO at Videra Health, Lauren Larson. How are you today? I'm great. I'm excited to be here. Excited to have you here. Let's dive right in. Tell us a little bit about your background. Great. Well, uh, I'm a computer scientist by training. Um, when I was in graduate school, I wanted to study AI and cognitive science. And back then, it wasn't that interesting a field. The computers weren't powerful enough to do anything super interesting. Um, so I ended up doing other things, which led me into video. And I'll you know, talk about that quite a bit today. But I um, started building computer networks that did video um, back in the early 2000s. And that led me to a company that um, started doing internet television back in the day when you'd push play and you'd wait and wait and wait and you'd start and stop. And they kind of figured out how to do HD TV over, over the internet, which was, which was fun. And then I ended up at a company doing voice video relay for the deaf and hard of hearing, which is, you know, how the deaf world actually can make a phone call to the hearing world by creating a video call to a, a sign language interpreter. And they sign back and forth while the interpreter speaks to the hearing person and they can make a phone call, but they'd always been tethered to their living room. Um, and so they wanted to build a mobile version of that um, before iPhones had cameras on the front. So we built the technology. And as soon as Apple released an iPhone with a camera on the front, they, they could make mobile phone calls, which unfortunately was sometimes driving down the road, signing as they drove. Um, <laughs> um, and then that led me to a company that was really sort of pivotal to our, our healthcare story, which was a company called HireVue. Uh, and the founder of HireVue was named Mark Newman, and he had invented this idea of an asynchronous job interview, where you created a structured set of questions, and then you invited people to answer them on their own time, wherever they wanted. And the, the traditional way to evaluate someone for a job is you look at their resume, and they all look kind of the same. They might be true. They might not be true. They might be written by the person. They might not be. And you make a decision, which is a really terrible way to evaluate somebody. In some ways, it's kind of like the vital signs of healthcare. It's your blood, blood pressure and your pulse and your temperature. It's a very cursory view of who someone is. Um, or you phone screen them, and you're constrained by how many phone interviews a recruiter can do in a day, um, which isn't very many, and no shows, and you reschedule and reschedule. Um, so he invented this idea that you just invite people to interview. They click a link from wherever they're at and they answer the questions on video and then you get a thousand interviews and you can watch go through them and jared if you've done much interviewing for people for jobs you know that most of the time you get on a phone interview it's like uh five minutes in you're like nope that's not the right person but you stay on and spend 30 minutes with with a recorded video you kind of go nope 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 oh this person's fantastic let me share them with the rest of my team right and um, it was a really nice way for people to be evaluated on who they are, um, but in a way that was scalable for the recruiting team. And um, it was really amazing technology. It was a great company. Um, and along the way, we started to say, gosh, isn't there a similar problem in healthcare? And that was kind of the impetus. What we learned at HireVue was what kind of caused us to want to start Videra Health. And... Thank you so much for that background, by the way, too. That leads in so nicely to my next question, right? Is let, give us an overview of Adara Health. You know, where are things at today? Who are your core, uh, I guess, stakeholders, customers that you work with or, uh, or like to work with? Yeah, great. Um, that's a great question. Let me, let me add a little bit more to the, the higher view story I should have added. I think what, what we found with, with, with the hiring side of things was, we became really successful to now assess a lot of people. You could now interview a thousand people, 5,000 people, 10,000 people. And I remember sitting in a room and a customer ran in one day. I'm like, we interviewed a thousand people last night. This is awesome. We've got a thousand interviews, a thousand people to think about. And then they realized like, how do I watch that video? How am I going to consume a thousand? It's a great way to see people, but how do I actually consume it? And so we, we had this really interesting data set that had never existed before of we had a million recorded job interviews that no one had ever, no one ever had recorded interviews before, at least in that volume. And so we decided to build an AI layer on top of the interviews to sort of say, could the system watch the interviews for you and tell you who'd be great? Um, and, you know, it turns out most people are actually terrible at interviewing. We have all kinds of biases. We, you know, if you've ever put 10 people in a room to evaluate a candidate, 
you're not going to get consensus. You're probably going to get an hour of debate about why this candidate's terrible or great. Or, um, and so how do you make that objective? Let, a watch, let AI watch it based on how a person answers important questions about who they are and what they can do in a job. Um, so we built that AI layer and it, it really streamlined the process because now you get 10,000 interviews and we can say, here are the top hundred candidates who might be the best. And then you spend time with those people um, rather than trying to see all 10,000. Um, and we had to build machine learning algorithms that, um, you know, that were scientifically valid, that didn't have bias in them. Um, and so that's where we sort of started to see like, there's a pretty similar thing in healthcare. In healthcare, we don't have enough people to see all of the people who need to be seen. Um, doctors are really busy. Providers are swamped, burning out. Um, but people need to be seen. If you're not in front of your doctor, that doesn't mean life isn't happening, right? When you leave your doctor today in our system, you're on your own for the most part. And the ways that we follow up either don't scale because we're trying to make phone calls to people and say, hey, how are you doing? But people don't answer the phone. If you do reach them during work, then they're probably in a place they can't talk. Um, and then you try to go, well, let's talk after hours. Well, the person calling isn't there after hours. And, and then you never reach people. Or you send text messages that get back a short response or try to reduce like, you know, how have you been doing the last week on a scale of one to 10? It's like, how do I reduce my life experience in the last week to a scale of one to 10? And it's my six the same as somebody else's four. Um, so we don't really have great ways to follow up. Does that make sense? It, make, it makes sense. And I guess talk us through like the significance of like Videra using, uh, you know, a async um, video versus, you know, uh, like what we see in, in telehealth often, right? Where it's yep. that, that kind of face-to-face, -face, um, you know, through our phone interaction. Yeah, it's a great question. I think telehealth is an amazing advance. Um, it lets people see the doctor when they don't need to travel and at long distances and when you can't go to the office because of COVID. Um, but it still requires a person to be there. And fundamentally, you need to see people when there isn't anyone to be there. You need to see what's going on with patients in those gaps. So that's what Videra is really doing today is we're letting people check in with their provider with video. They answer a question on video whenever they want, wherever they want. Um, you know, we send them a text and say, hey, Dr. So-and-so wants to hear from you. They answer the questions. And then this AI layer sits on top of that that says, no, really, how are you doing? What's your, what's your mood? What's your sentiment? We can measure from even a single video response, kind of the PHQ-9 score, GAD-7 score, PCL-5 for trauma, um, as well as other biomarkers, um, and let you kind of see, like, who in my population really needs help right now versus who's doing fine? Um, I think that's the key thing that we're trying to solve with Videra is how do we see people so they get the right people get seen at the right time. And obviously the benefits of that are we have better outcomes. We intervene early. We keep people out of the ER and intervene before they get into a crisis. Um, people just don't reach out for help um, for a lot of reasons. So when you look at like lots of different things, right? There's the, there's text-based prompts, there's audio, there's video. You you gave us already a lot about you know the the importance of video and why you know but for that to be your focus what was like that core is is it is it time savings is it you know a, a multitude of things you know um, I I guess w like in, in a you, you've already given us a lot of round video right but yeah. why video and what does video allow you to do that maybe audio and text fails to do. Yeah, a great question. I think that the power of video is there's sort of the patient side and then I think there's the, the provider side. From the patient side, what we've observed is that it's actually kind of empowering to just talk about yourself. And um, it's a pretty open-ended way to just express yourself. Um, we know from research that people will say more even when they're just talking to a picture or an avatar where there's no judgment on the other side and they can just go. Um, people say a lot. So you collect a lot of data and it's empowering for, for patients to just be able to express themselves compared to some of the other mediums where it's a survey or a text, uh, which feels a little constraining and not a full view of who they are. Um, and then for the provider side, I think we often hear sort of two things. One, we'll hear from us like, if I could just see my patient for 15 seconds, if I just had a video of them, I'd know what's going on. Um, 
So if someone's going to watch, I think video is much more powerful than kind of the equivalent of listening to a voicemail, um, which I can't remember the last time I listened to a voicemail myself. <laughs> um, and then, you know, when you think about what you can measure from video, you know, there are certain things that are pretty easy to get from audio and language, anxiety, depression, have good results with just audio and language. Um, but when you get into other things, like there was just a great article about work uh, done on you walk into the ER, they want to take a video of you to predict if you're having a stroke at the ER, right? Like that's really interesting. Um, but that's a video, video visual thing. Uh, if you take like movement disorders, uh, the first thing we ever worked on was an NIH study around tardive dyskinesia. Um, the clinical assessment is your provider asks you to do a series of things and watches you. Um, it is inherently video. Um, so if you really want to see the whole person, we feel like and get the whole picture, you need to see video. Audio will always be a little bit less. Super interesting. That makes sense, right? Like if someone, good luck. We, we, we as, as humans, right? Like if I asked you something, how are you feeling, right? Before you might have a stroke, you might say something, but like you're saying, being able to actually see the signs, right? In, in a video format versus just taking someone at their word uh, yeah. is a much more efficient way of doing things. So yeah. really interesting. Now, uh, when, when we look at your, your business and where it's at today, you know, what excites you? What's next for, for the organization? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've spent a few years building this technology and we spent the last year really rolling it out to larger systems. Uh, we started in kind of small addiction recovery, mental health clinics, and have moved to, to larger systems. Uh, we see a lot of interest from payers as well. Um, so we're really excited about the sort of the commercial growth of the business and the opportunity to impact more populations. Um, you know, I think our long-term vision for this is we know there are a lot of things you can measure through listening to someone talk and seeing them. Um, it can go well beyond uh, what we would see from it, even just mental health, early signs of Parkinson's, cognitive decline. Um, there are a lot of things we can measure, like the stroke example that, that I gave. Um, why can't you check in with your PCP every quarter and just get a readout on how you're doing? Can we find early signs and intervene before you get to your next routine visit, if you even do one? Um, I think that's the thing that we're building towards is making this just kind of the ubiquitous test for quantifying all these things that are not easily seen today. Well, I'm, I'm excited to you know be able to continue the conversation with you and hopefully have you come back on the podcast in the near future. But I uh, am so appreciative that you came on and, and told us about your background and your story and... Um, the importance of video, like the way that you explained it, super cool. Um, it makes it makes a ton of sense uh, why video was your focus. And hopefully we can have you come back on in the near future and we can dive into some more topics, but I really appreciate you coming on the show today. Sounds great, Jared. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah.